It was time for King Eurystheus to give Hercules his sixth task. This time, Eurystheus gave Hercules the labor of traveling to Aegean and cleaning the king of Aegean stables in a single day. This doesn't seem like much of a task for an immortal hero, although these particular stables housed thousands of cattle, sheep, goats, and horses and the stable had not been cleaned in 30 years. The Aegean king was said to have more cattle than any man in Greece. Task 6. The Aegean Stables Hercules showed up before the king of Aegea and offered to clean up his stable in one day. The king walked up to him and spoke to him confidently. Listen, O oh stranger, if you clean all of my stables in one day, I will give over to you the tenth part of all my possessions and cattle. Hercules didn't say anything about how he was sent by Eurystheus or about his labors of redemption. He accepted the offer and set off to work. He took the king's son along to watch. First, the hero tore a big opening in the wall of the cattle yard where the stables were. Then he made another opening in the wall on the opposite side of the yard. Hercules set to work tearing a big hole in the front of the stable yards. Next, Hercules made a hole in the back wall of the stable yards. These holes were connected to the two rivers flowing nearby. Hercules then turned the course of the rivers into the yard. The rivers rushed through the stables, flushing them out, and all of the mess flowed out of the hole in the wall on the other side of the yard. That's how Hercules accomplished the menial work without stooping to anything unworthy of an immortal. He met the king after completing the task and asked for the promised reward. However, the king of Augea learned that Hercules' work had been done in service of Eurystheus. He now refused to reward Hercules, saying that if Hercules didn't agree, he could seek a settlement at the Augean courts. So Hercules did just that. The judge took his seat. Hercules called the son of Augeas to testify. The boy swore that his father had agreed to give Hercules a reward. The judge ruled that Hercules would have to be paid. The king reluctantly paid Hercules and then promptly banished both his son and Hercules from his kingdom. So the boy went to the north country to live with his aunts and Hercules headed back to Mycenae. When all of the animals who lived in the stable came home that night from the fields, they found clean beds of hay, warm buckets of oats, and fresh water running. They could not have been more happy. But Eurystheus said that this labor didn't count because Hercules was paid for having done the work. One day, King Minos, the ruler of Crete, prayed to the sea god Poseidon 
for a special bull to sacrifice to Zeus, the highest Olympian god. Poseidon granted his wish, and a magnificent bull emerged from the ocean. King Minos was dazzled by the beauty of this amazing creature. King Minos decided not to sacrifice this bull and sacrificed another one instead. When Poseidon came to know about this, he punished Minos for his disobedience by making Pasiphae, the king's wife, fall in love with this animal. As a result, Pasiphae gave birth to the Minotaur, a monster with the head of a bull and the body of a man. Poseidon was still mad at the king, so he turned the bull mad so mad that fire was coming out of its nostrils. To the Minoans, bulls were sacred. It was against their religion to kill a bull. They tried to recapture it without harming it, but they did not succeed. The bull hid during the day. At night, it ripped destruction from one end of the island to the other. To capture this animal, master it, and bring it before Eurystheus was the seventh labor of Hercules. Task 7. The Cretan Bull Hercules arrived in Crete as instructed by Eurystheus. The beast was hiding in a forest at the far end of the island. When the bull saw Hercules, it was scared. He did not fight Hercules and bowed its head down. Hercules quickly grabbed its horn and climbed on top. So thoroughly did Hercules master the animal that he drove it back to King Eurystheus. Eurystheus saw that Hercules had succeeded in bringing back the Cretan bull. He planned to sacrifice the beast to his benefactor, the Greek goddess Hera. Hera hated Hercules. She did not wish to receive a sacrifice because of the work of her husband's illegitimate son and refused the offering. Eurystheus had no other option than to set the bull free. When it was no longer under the management of Hercules, the bull became wild again and wandered in the city, destroying everything in its sight. It wandered around Greece, terrorizing the people, and ended up in Marathon, a city near Athens. At Marathon, the bull stopped its wandering and instead caused damage to property and people, just as it had done in Crete, and later acquired the name Marathonian Bull. Later, Theseus, son of the king of Athens, Aegeus, set forth to capture the bull. He went to Marathon and indeed successfully caught it. He then returned to Athens, where he sacrificed it to Athena or Apollo. Theseus would of course later travel to Crete, where he killed the offspring of the Cretan bull, the Minotaur, killing it inside the labyrinth near the palace of King Minos. Diomedes was the mean king of Thrace. He was a cruel giant who ruled the land ruthlessly. Diomedes was the son of Mars, the god of war, and he was considered a great warrior. He owned four ferocious mares who were so wild that they had to be secured with an iron chain. They were kept in a bronze manger tied to a golden post. These terrible creatures had fire coming out of their nostrils, and they sometimes ate humans too. The evil king would feed the innocent newcomers to the island to his horses. 
Stealing the mares of Diomedes was the eighth task of Hercules. King Diomedes had a huge army of Bistonian men who were a bunch of nasty barbarians. They always kept guard of the king's mares. Task 8. Mares of Diomedes For accomplishing this task, Hercules took with him his young squire Abderos, whom he cared for very much. They sailed with his volunteer across Egon, and after many days of travel, they finally reached Thrice. Once they reached the island, off they went in the middle of the night to steal the crazed man-eating mares. They snuck up on the horses, but before he could release them, Bistonian men saw them and attacked. Diomedes woke up hearing the commotion. He was not very happy when he heard that Hercules was trying to steal his favorite mares. Hercules asked Abderos to take care of the mares while he went ahead and fought Diomedes. The king was huge, but Hercules was stronger and smarter. Hercules defeated the king easily and returned to Abderos. But it was too late. When the mares got hungry, they ate his favorite squire. When Hercules saw this, he was very sad and angry. Enraged, Hercules fed Diomedes to his own mares. Once the mares were done munching on their former master, they reverted to being regular calm mares. When the Bistonian soldiers saw what happened to their king, they started running away. Hercules rode the calm mares back to Macedonia and presented them before Eurystheus. Eurystheus ordered the horses be taken to Olympus to be sacrificed to Zeus. But Zeus refused the sacrifice and instead sent lions, wolves, and bears to kill the wild mares. The mares indeed had such notorious reputation. It is said that one of the mares managed to survive and had powerful descendants. Alexander of Macedonia or Alexander the Great is believed to rode one of them. As for Hercules, he greatly grieved over the loss of his friend and later founded a city in honor of Abderos, naming it after him. Hippolyta was the queen of the tribe of the Amazons in Greek mythology. She was the daughter of the god of war, Ares, who had given her a magical belt as a gift. The belt didn't seem to be spectacular. At first glance, it seemed like nothing more than any other leather belt. But this one held magical properties that were granted to Hippolyta as she wore it. It also represented her authority over her people, much in the same way that a crown signified a king's power. King Eurystheus wanted to present this belt to his daughter, and this was the ninth labor of Hercules. Task 9. The Belt of Hippolyta The Amazons inhabited the region of the river Thermodon and were a race of strong women who followed the occupations of men. They were an all-female tribe of warriors who hated and distrusted men. Hercules gathered his warrior companions into a ship and sailed through the Black Sea to accomplish his ninth task. They sailed for many days, and Hercules kept thinking for ideas to get the belt from Hippolyta. 
there was no way that his small band of supporters could defeat a whole nation of dedicated fighters. After a long journey, they reached the land of the Amazons. Hercules and the Greeks got off the boat and waited at the dock. Hippolyta was informed by her warriors that a ship had appeared on the horizon. The Amazons had never had visitors to their homeland before, and both she and her people were curious about these newcomers to their lands. When Hippolyta arrived at the dock, Hercules greeted her and sought permission to meet her in private. In the candlelight, Hercules told his story. Hippolyta listened, concealing her pity and feelings. Hippolyta was torn because she knew what the belt symbolized to herself as well as to her people. But she was not heartless and felt great pity, compassion, and sorrow upon hearing Hercules' story. Finally, Hippolyta agreed to give him the belt so that he could finish this ninth task. Hera, who hated Hercules, overheard this, and she was not very happy. She had been trying to foil and curse Hercules at every opportunity for years. She disguised as an Amazon warrior and went up and down the army saying to each woman that the strangers who had arrived were going to carry off the queen. The Amazons were terrified. They put on their armor and raced down the hill. They began a battle with Hercules and his crew. Hippolyta didn't understand what had happened and tried to calm her people, but they were too angry to listen. In the great battle that ensued, Hippolyta got accidentally killed. Hercules knew that he didn't have much time before his ship would be completely overrun. He kissed Hippolyta lightly on the cheek and with the belt in his grasp, set sail towards Mycenae. When he reached back home, he gave the belt to King Eurystheus, thus completing his ninth labor. Hercules completed his ninth labor and laid the belt of Queen Hippolyte at the feet of King Eurystheus. But the king gave him no rest and assigned his next task immediately. Obtaining the cattle of Gerion from Eurythia was Hercules' tenth task. These cattle were magnificent beasts with coats made red by the red light of the sunset. The danger in this task, though, was the fact that the cattle were owned by Gerion. Gerion himself was enormous. He had three bodies, three heads, six arms, and six feet. Gerion was the son of Calirho, who was the daughter of Oceanus and Tethys, which made Gerion the grandson of the Titans. On his island, Gerion kept a herd of red cattle guarded by Cerebrus's brother Orthus, a two-headed hound, and the fierce herdsman Eurytion. Task 10. Cattle of Gerion. Hercules set off on for Eurythia, encountering and promptly killing many wild beasts along the way. After long wandering through desert country, he came at last to a fruitful land through which great streams flowed. Here, he founded a city of vast size, which he named Hecatompolos, which means city of a hundred gates. When Hercules reached the most western point of his journey, he split a mountain in half, creating the Strait of Gibraltar. These mountains were later known as the Pillars of Hercules. 
Hercules then crossed the Libyan desert. After traveling through the desert for three days and three nights, Hercules was so hot and thirsty by now. He got so angry that he shot an arrow at the sun. Helios, or the sun god, was not mad at Hercules' failed attempt to kill him. Instead, Helios admired Hercules' courage and granted him a golden cup. This wasn't a cup for drinking, for you see, it was a cup that would allow the last leg of Hercules' journey. It was a special cup that Hercules was going to sail in to the island of Erythia. The golden boat allowed Hercules to quickly sail to Erythia, and on the island shoreline, the hero landed. Not long after he arrived, Orthus, the two-headed dog, attacked Hercules. So Hercules bashed him with his club, killing him in a single stroke. He also killed the giant herdsman who came to help the dog. Just as Hercules was hurrying away with the cattle, he was confronted by Gerion himself. Hercules, exhausted from his travels, took out an arrow and dipped it in the poisonous blood from the Lernaean Hydra and shot Gerion in each of his three heads, killing him instantly. Hera, however, was not about to let the hero accomplish this labor. When Hercules reached Thrace, Hera sent a swarm of gadflies to bite the cattle. When the gadflies started biting the cattle, they got scared and scattered all over the island. It took Hercules a whole year to gather back all the cattle and continue his journey. Hera then caused the river Strymon to flood to make it impassable. The flood was only a minor setback. Hercules threw rocks into the river until it was shallow enough for the cattle to safely cross it. Eventually, Hercules returned to the court of King Eurystheus, driving the cattle of Gerion before him. Once again, Eurystheus was disappointed by the fact that Hercules had not died in the attempting of the task. Taking the cattle from the hero, Eurystheus sacrificed all of the herd to his benefactor, Hera. Eurystheus wasted no time and he summoned Hercules to give him his next labor. For the final and most difficult labor, King Eurystheus asked Hercules to bring him Cerberus from the underworld to prove his strength and fearlessness. To Eurystheus, this seemed an impossible task. Task 12. Capture Cerberus. Cerberus was a vicious beast that guarded the entrance to Hades and kept the living from entering the world of the dead. According to some legends, Cerberus was a strange mixture of creatures. He had three heads of wild dogs, a dragon for a tail, and heads of snakes all over his back. Hercules was not daunted. Before making the trip to the underworld, Hercules decided that he should take some extra precautions. This was, after all, a journey from which no mortal had ever returned. Hercules decided to be initiated in the Eleusinian Mysteries so that he would be taught how to travel alive from the world of the living to the realm of the dead and vice versa. The ancients believed that those who learned the secrets of the mysteries would have happiness in the underworld. After the hero met a few conditions of membership, the priests initiated Hercules into the mysteries. 
Then, with strength to meet the horrors of the underworld, Hercules traveled on to the Laconian city of Tainaris, which contained the opening to the underworld. Through a deep, rocky cave, Hercules made his way down to the underworld. He encountered monsters, heroes, and ghosts as he made his way through. The first barrier to the soul's journey beyond the grave was the River Styx. One could cross this river only with the help of Sharon, the boatman's ferry boat. Sharon accepted only those who were dead and whose corpses had gold coins under their tongues. Hercules met neither condition. Suddenly, goddess Hestia appeared, and she helped him negotiate with Sharon. Sharon agreed and helped Hercules cross the Styx. Hercules then found the entrance to the underworld, but instead of attacking Cerberus, he went straight to Hades to ask permission to take his beloved hellhound. Hades was impressed by the respect shown by Hercules in coming to him first before going to his hound. Hades was so impressed, in fact, that he allowed Hercules to try his luck, but only on a few conditions. Hercules could not kill or seriously injure Cerberus. This meant no weapons could be used. He found the dog camping near the dwelling of Acheron. Without paying any attention to the bellowing of the three heads, which was like the echo of fearful resounding thunder, he seized the dog by the legs, put his arms around his neck, and would not let him go. The dragon tail of the animal kept biting him in his cheek, but Hercules held the dog even stronger. Cerberus had to submit to the force of the hero, and Hercules left the underworld. The king, who thought this was a suicide mission, was shocked, dismayed, and frightened when he saw Hercules with Cerberus. Cowering behind his throne, he gave Hercules due credit for this final labor. Hercules then went on to return the dog to its master. Hades made an appearance in front of Eurystheus, demanding to know why he would want his favorite pup as a trophy. Eurystheus almost fainted. Begging Hades' forgiveness and asking that he spare him, Eurystheus revealed that he received orders for all of Hercules' labors from Hera herself. The tale goes that a none too happy Hades visited Hera and warned her if she ever sent Hercules on any such errand again, she would have to deal with him. Thus did the labors of Hercules come to an end.